Um, I do have some announcements. Yeah, if you want to run it up, thanks, Seb. Um, I'd just like to, to give you a, a bit of a, an update on what's going on. Certainly, first, to apologise for the state of the calendar. We're playing Goldilocks. Last month, it was too small, and people were complaining because they couldn't read it because the text was too small. This month, I made it bigger. Couldn't fit it on a page. So we're, we're, next month, it'll be just right. No, it'll, it'll, it'll probably be something different again. All right, so I apologise for the state of the calendar. It is very easy to read in comparison when you use the website. Um, I'm, I'm making my job a little bit easier when it comes to the calendar and, and making it digital first and foremost because it's just an easier system to keep updated and it, it means it's hard for me to print one to put on the wall and I'm finding that part a little bit difficult. But if you have access to the website you'll find it's probably easier to read there. Um, but on that calendar, you'll find a few things coming up in the next couple of weeks. Uh, tomorrow, we have an opportunity for some inter-church fellowship uh, at Forest Lake Community Centre. Tim Bunch, the pastor at Garden City Baptist Church in Toowoomba, is hosting what he's called Church Olympics. Both physical and spiritual. All right. So I'm sure they'll have some silly races and some games. Uh, for those that feel youthful, lively and energetic and there'll be some, just some spiritual encouragement for the brethren. So that's between 10 and 2 tomorrow at Forest Lake Community Centre. Uh, bring yourself, bring a Bible if, you, if you've got one there um, and a good attitude really. Uh, there is some comment about you won't get extra points if you bribe Pastor Bunch but I think that means the opposite of what it says. So by all means take M&Ms and chocolates and try and give to Pastor Bunch in the hopes of advancing our church's effort. So you shouldn't do that, Pastor, it's terrible. Well, if you can't follow that, then the Church Olympics is not going to be for you because it's going to be all fun and frivolity, all right? So if you're going to be real serious about it, or you might find it hard, but if you're happy bribing officials with chocolates, tomorrow's the day for you, all right? <laughs> it gives you an idea of what to expect, all right? So Church Olympics tomorrow. Um, ladies Bible study is coming up next Saturday, keep that in mind uh, for the ladies here at the church, 10.30. Uh, the following day is Mother's Day, uh, looking forward to that. Um, if you're able to be with here for fellowship, that would be great. Uh, we have a, a business meeting we're trying to, we we're hoping to do today, but I need to defer that um, probably not till next week because that's Mother's Day and some of you will want to go home for Mother's Day lunch and that's cruel punishment. Um, but then the next Sunday on the 18th, or sorry, the 19th, we'll try and re, uh, reschedule that business meeting. Um, we would like to do a working bee on the 18th. Uh, probably it's a fairly specialised working bee because that's the day we're looking to concrete in some posts and drill to put some gates, one down here on the driveway and one up the top there to try and stop vehicle traffic coming through. Um, so if you turn up after the 18th and there's a gate there that you've never seen before, um, park in the disabled car park. <laughs> no, it's, there'll be a key in a lockbox. I won't say that in front of everyone as to where that is, but there's a lockbox that'll have a key to that gate so people will be able to get in, but it's just a measure of security that's going to be best given the, the increased problems we've had um, securing the property and we're just trying to make some, make some effort in the area of being good stewards there. So that's on the 18th. If you'd like to help, come see me. Um, maybe talk to Pete as well. Would you like if there's some volunteers to talk to you? You've got some, some things happening. Um, so, the 18th, keep it in mind. Uh, the next day, on the 19th, do you think it's going to be cold? We're, we're going to do baptisms. You say, in May again, why did we do this last year? Because it just seems to be the best time at the moment. Um, so, we are, in two weeks, going to host a baptismal service. We've got a couple of folks that are looking to be baptised. If you haven't been baptised and you are willing to brave not just the, the public... Let's be honest, it's a little bit embarrassing being baptised. It's just, it's a, it's a, it's a kind of a humbling process. It's, but if you're willing to do that, you haven't been and you'd like to publicly profess your faith in the Lord uh, by going through the waters of baptism, um, not that that's going to save you or make you any better as a Christian, but it is the way the Scriptures teach us to make our salvation public, to profess it, to, to picture it for everyone. So if you haven't done that, um, it is something Christians should do and if you would like to talk to me before next, well, on the 19th, then we'd be able to fit you in. Um, 
please be praying for folks that are sick. Dave mentioned Heather. Keep on praying for Heather. Um, I want you to keep praying for Sophie. That's Zena's uh, daughter-in-law. I can't see Zena. Sorry, Zena. Praying for Sophie. Um, she's been struggling with cancer for a while now. She was diagnosed with stage three breast cancer, which has been a group. It's stage four. Yeah. It's, it's, it's uh, got worse. Let's just say that. Um, and progressed into the lymphatic system, but they've also picked up a couple of spots of cancer on her brain. So she was looking for surgery um, and preparing for surgery last week, and that's been postponed until they can treat the cancer in the brain. It's a very serious situation. Like it's, you can't underestimate or downplay how serious and life-threatening that is, um, and Sophie's not saved. So she needs to know the Lord. Uh, she's got a, a young family and just keep on praying for her, her husband, Tony, the kids, the family as well. It's a very, um, it's a heavy situation. It's a very heavy weight to bear. So pray for Sophie. Um, also be good to pray for Gus. He had a fall and he's got rib damage. Um, he's struggling away. He's here today, so you can make sure you give him a big hug. <laughs> Don't, all right. Um, Dave, you wanted to add something? As well? Yeah, is she down for treatment, guys, or is she, no? She's just ongoing issues with cancer. There, um, it was of the jaw or the eye. Where was it? I can't remember. Skull. Start in the skull. Okay, surgery in the skull. Yep. So uh, Wendy Katsumatis and cancer there. So keep praying for them. Um, so that's our announcements. Now we normally do that before we sing our last hymn. So I'm going to do something different. I'm going to get us to sing just one verse of "Cleanse Me." which is like 160 something. So Chelsea, can you just come and play through one verse of that for us? Um, I don't want to make too much of a, a transition straight into the preaching. We'll pray, but I want you just to be ready for us to sing. We'll pray first, Chelsea, and then we'll sing this verse together before we, the preaching. Uh, it's 163, I think. No, it can't be 166. All right, we'll pray for some of the needs um, that, we, that we've mentioned already. Heavenly Father, we do ask that you might be at work in our church, be at work in the hearts of uh, each one that, um, that carries heavy burdens, particularly today. We pray for Heather at home, um, longing to be in fellowship, but physically unable. So we pray that you would strengthen her and help her. And we pray that you would work in, in her life. We pray for the family and pray that you would sustain as only you can. We pray for Sophie and for Tony, her husband, that we pray firstly for their salvation and secondly for uh, your power to be at work in delivering her from that cancer. And we ask for your grace, mercy and just opportunities for, for these, this family to trust in you. And we pray that you would comfort those that are carrying this burden heavily. We do pray for those that are afflicted um, and struggling. Pray for Gus with the ribs. Pray that, that, would, that the pain would ease for him and he would recover quickly. We pray for the coming events, for the, the fellowship opportunity tomorrow with different churches meeting. We ask that you would help the time to go smoothly and safely and that it might be a time where saints edify one another and, uh, and share in joy and fellowship. Lord, we thank you for the privilege of um, time spent with brethren. We do pray, uh, dear Lord, for the, the ladies' Bible study, for the working bee, uh, for the baptismal service. We commit all these things to you. Lord, we thank you for the country in which we live and we pray that you might use us as we, as we serve you here, as we evangelise and share Christ with the world. We pray that you would open doors and soften hearts. We pray that your spirit might work in convicting our nation and leading our leaders, that we might cease from making ungodly and unbiblical decisions as a country and there might be a, a willingness to obey your word. We do ask these things knowing that that would be quite a miracle knowing that the days are evil and the time is short before the Lord comes back. So we pray that you might have your way in this church and through us in this country, uh, that we might be vessels uh, of honour and faithful ambassadors for Christ. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you can please stand with me. We're going to sing just verse 2 um, of Cleanse Me, which is 166. All right, it's 166. And we'll sit, stand and sing verse 2 only. Thank you. 
cleansing me from sin. Fulfill thy word, make me within. Fill me with fire, where once I burned with shame. Grant my desire to magnify thy name. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you for coming back and doing that for us, Chelsea. All right. Ephesians is where we'll spend most of our time, Ephesians chapter 5, but I'm going to just quote a couple of the verses that David read for us by our Bible reading from um, from Galatians 5 regarding the, the walking in the Spirit. And the title for today's message is indeed Walking in the Spirit. And that comes from what we'll see in Ephesians. But firstly, just by way of reminding you, Galatians 5.16 calls us as Christians. He says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other so that you cannot do the things that you would. But if you be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. And down to verse 25, we see, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. It is good for us to think about what it is to walk in the Spirit and be filled with the Spirit. Because you and I know well that a lot of people get confused about these two things. Turn over into the book of Ephesians where we've been studying for some time into chapter 5 and see in verse 8, the passage that we'll look at in a moment, we see a negative command, a positive command and blessed results of obedience in the area of walking in the Spirit, being filled with the Spirit. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you might help me as I preach that the Word of God may go forth in power and that the Spirit of God may minister to the hearts and lives, the thoughts and the emotions of your people. We pray that your Spirit might take the Word and convict the hearts of the lost, that they might see their need to trust Christ. I pray that your Word might be the balm that heals the wounds of the heart. I pray that it might be the rebuke that we need to correct us from heading astray. I pray that the Word of God, ministered by the Spirit of God, might be what we need. We ask that you would magnify the name of Christ and Lord we wonder in amazement at all that you've done for us. We pray that we might walk worthy of the vocation wherewith we've been called. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, Before we even look at these verses it'd be good just to remind you that Ephesians is a book about the believer's wealth and subsequent walk. The first three chapters tell us about what we have as believers. And it it enunciates or it lists in some detail the things that are ours in Christ. How rich we are. Now, we've been blessed individually in Christ by the Father, by the Son, by the Holy Spirit. We've been saved, we've been sealed, we've been adopted. There's a great list of wonderful... In fact, what does it say? Every spiritual blessing in high places. We're not just kind of blessed, but we are blessed with every and all spiritual blessing. Now, some people get all confused about what that might mean. Does that mean I should have ecstatic experiences? Does that mean I should speak in tongues because I've been blessed? Does that mean I should live a life of health, wealth and prosperity? I've blessed it? No. Paul actually says what the spiritual blessings are in Ephesians. He tells us that it's our, our salvation our redemption, our adoption, our sealing and our security. He says we have an inheritance in glory. He tells us how rich we are. And then he prays that we might understand it. He says, I just want them to understand who they are in Christ. In fact, if you look in Ephesians 3, he gives us this prayer and I want to remind you of it. Ephesians 3 verse 14. After saying about just giving everything... Verse 14, for this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, talking to these believers, talking to God about these believers, I'm asking that God would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might 
by his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints, all right? I just want you to get this and understand it and comprehend what believers know, the breadth, the length, the depth and height, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with the fullness of God. Paul is praying that believers would grasp just the wonder of the blessings we have. And then in chapter 4, verse 1, he makes a transition. And you remember that? He then says, I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you, I beg of you, I entreat or I implore, walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you're called. You are a Christian, you are a son of a heavenly father, and you have an inheritance in glory. Start living like it. That's what chapters 4 through 6 are all about. Chapters 1 through 3 are the believer's position, yes, who we are. Chapters 4 through 6, our practice, how we ought to live. And there's zero commands in the first three chapters. There are 35 commands in chapters 4 through 6. So here he gets very practical. And in chapter 4, he mentions unity. I said before we were blessed as individuals. Do you remember how we're also blessed corporately? That we're one body? He says that in chapters 2 and 3. And then in chapter 4, he says, this is how you should walk like it. Walk in unity. I told you that we're holy. You know, when, as a believer, if you are clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, if you have trusted Jesus as your saviour, when God looks at you right now, he sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ. He does not see or judge your sin. Do you feel blessed yet? Do you feel like you deserve that? No. We sit there and wonder at that spiritual truth. We are holy because he has declared us to be holy, clothed and sheltered in his Jesus righteousness. Chapter 4 says, well, if you're holy, then walk in holiness. Don't live the way the world lives. You are positionally holy, you should be practically holy and living this kind of life. Not like the world who has no inheritance, not like those who have no hope but are waiting for judgment. Don't live like them, live like children of the king. Chapter 5, he talks about the walk of light, love and wisdom. We're children of light, don't walk in darkness. You see how he's been doing this. And in chapter 5, we get to these verses, and there's only a few that we'll look at today, where he teaches us to walk in the Spirit. Now, he doesn't use that phrase, but he's teaching that concept. He says, don't be drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be ye filled with the Spirit. There is two commands there. Did you catch them? Amen. There's a negative, Christians don't, and there is a positive, Christians do. Now, the first is very practical and applicable. You know, the Bible warns you and I about the danger of alcohol. Come on. Don't meddle, don't play with a substance that God says destroys. Right. Oh, so, you know, drunkenness is a sin, but drinking's not. Alcohol is a mocker. Amen. Strong drink is raging. Do not be deceived. Because, look, this is easy for me because I was a drunk before I got saved. A social drunk, but a drunk. All right? I drink Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday mornings. All right? If I had someone to sit with, I would. If I didn't, then I wouldn't. All right? So when I got saved, it was easy for me. That was the old man and I'm a new man, and I want nothing to do with that. It was easy. But I meet people, Christians, who try and work through the Scriptures and say, well, drunkenness is definitely a sin, and I agree with that, but maybe a couple of drinks is okay. Where is the line? How do you know when you're drunk and when you're not? Well, Australia says 0.05. That's not a biblical rule. That's just what we, like the, the Transport Authority, have said, all right? So you can't drive people. Don't drink. It is so simple. It is so simple. Because then you're not, you say, oh, pastor, that's legalism. It's, it's cautious. It's careful. There's no reason to drink. You know when you talk to someone who wants to drink, you know why they want to drink? Because it loosens them up. It removes their inhibitions. They can relax a little bit. Guess what? That alcohol is influencing you. 
and you are desiring its influence. What does the Bible say? It says it plainly in verse 18, be not drunk with wine wherein is excess. That word excess in modern slang would be to be wasted, right? To, be, to lose control of faculty, to be under the influence entirely of alcohol to the point where you don't remember what you did last night, all right? Clearly, drunkenness and this, this excess is being condemned, but Paul is using the negative command to illustrate the principle of influence. Because we can all look at a drunk in the gutter and go, that guy's lost his mind. He is completely under the influence of alcohol. We know what that looks like. But he says, don't be under the complete influence of alcohol, but be ye filled with the Spirit. Amen. So you see why Paul is using that negative injunction, not just to tell us, oh, Christians, just a reminder, drinking is dangerous, drinking is wrong, don't be drunk, that's excessive. He's using, us, using that to lay the foundation of understanding for what it is to be filled with the Spirit, to be under the Spirit's influence in our lives moment by moment. You know, that word excess is the word that was used of the prodigal son in that parable who wasted his inheritance on riotous living, just completely wasted it all. It means to be out of control. You know, I think, I'm just talking about alcohol for a moment because I very rarely preach on issues like this, but it's good for me to get an opportunity just to say this. Amen. Some people today label alcoholism as a disease rather than a sin. All right. Now, there is predisposition to alcohol addiction. Right, that happens, and there are particular genetics where some people will be more, they'll struggle more with the addictive nature of alcohol. But if you label it as a disease, what is the solution? There is no solution for a disease of alcoholism, it's just your affliction and you're a victim to it. But if you correctly and biblically label drunkenness as sin, then there's hope. Because Jesus Christ forgives us of our sin and delivers us from the bondage that we have to sin. And I can tell an alcoholic there is hope for you in Jesus Christ because your problem is not merely a physical disease. It is a spiritual sin problem that Christ can cure. But if you're waiting for the, the healing of a disease rather than the deliverance from sin, you'll be waiting a really, really long time and you will constantly excuse behavior under the banner of, well, that's just my, my health or my, my lack of health. So be careful. And like, I'm not, I'm not denying proclivity or genetic predisposition. I'm not kind of refuting scientific study there, but at its core, drunkenness is a sin, not a disease. So we understand that foundation. By the way, in the context here that let's James, it's not James, I'm preaching on James later. <laughs> Ephesians, Paul in Ephesians is calling us to walk wisely in an evil world. You see it in verse 16, redeeming the time because the days are evil. He says, see then you walk circumspectly, not as fools but as wise. He's saying you need to be careful where you step in this world. You need to be on guard and watchful and aware because we live in the midst of evil. Now how do people deal with evil? The world deals with evil all around them with a drink because it numbs the senses and it allows someone who is overwhelmed just to relax for a moment. The problem is it's depressive, right? It makes you more depressed rather than helps you and it numbs you rather than deals with any problem. You know, the, and Christians can fall prey to this. I know many Christians who drink and they don't think they've got a problem. They think they've got it under control. They think, oh, no, it's just a drink or two with friends. I say, why? Why would you drink a drink or two with friends? Oh, because it relaxes me. I said this before. If it's relaxing you, it's influencing you. You be careful. If you're using alcohol to give you any sense of joy, peace, comfort, you hear what I'm saying, don't you? Who should you be going to as a Christian for joy, peace, and comfort? 
the bottle or the saviour. And it's obvious to me that you shouldn't be going to that because Christ is sufficient for the needs of my soul. I don't need to medicate my way through the sorrows of life. If anything, I should cast my burdens on him, knowing he cares for me rather than drowning sorrows. But it starts just a little and it becomes a comforting routine and it eases the stress and it becomes a habit and then it becomes like this addiction and soon enough you've got Christians trusting in their own self-medication than the Saviour himself and that's a sad place. But we understand the foundation. Let's move on to the positive command. He tells us don't be drunk with wine where is in excess but be filled with the Spirit. I want to deal with the last half of verse 18 here by asking, answering three questions. Firstly, what is the filling of the Spirit? Secondly, what is it not? And thirdly, how can I know that I am filled with the Spirit? Okay? What is it? What isn't it? And how can I know if I am? Because if it's a command, what should we do? Obey it. If you don't understand it, then you might be like, oh, I don't know if I'm filled with the Spirit. How many of you know this morning whether you're filled with the Spirit? Some, how do you know? It's because I speak in tongues. Garbage. Good. Oh, I know what, you know, I've got the, the, the word of prophet. Get out. Good. If you think you are, know you're filled with the Spirit because you have the word of prophecy, you best go. Good. All right? You know you're filled with the Spirit when you bear the fruit of the Spirit. And you don't walk and perform the works of the flesh. It is not some mystical spiritual concept that we can't understand. If you're walking in love, joy, peace, temperance and so on, then you're walking and filled in the Spirit, filled with the Spirit. So this morning, if you're there bitter against your neighbour, angry about this, jealous about this, you're not filled with the Spirit. Talk to some weird charismatics and they think they are because they speak in tongues or do some experience, but they demonstrate no fruit. They're not filled with the Holy Spirit. They're filled with a spirit, a demonic spirit, not God. The positive command for us, what is the filling of the Spirit? How do I know? Well, what is it? What is it not? How do I know? Now, I've given you some ideas and Paul did it by laying the foundation. To be filled with the Spirit is to behave under the complete influence of the Spirit. Where we say no to, well we allow, let's just say this, because it's a passive command, we are to be filled by God, not that we're to take the Holy Spirit and fill ourselves. You see, understand the difference? It's passive, something that He does to us when we yield every area of our life to the Spirit's control. I've said this before by way, of, by way of illustration, I'll share it again. I was asked to go to a man's house to pray for his new house. It's a weird thing to do, isn't it? No one here has ever asked me to come to your new house and commit the house to the Lord. And I, I, that's what I was asked to do. And I've gone, don't you have a pastor in a church that can do that for you? And he's like, no, 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 I don't know anyone here, but can you come and do it? And I said, actually, I'm free, I can do that. I'd like to talk to you about the Lord. So I've gone, all right, doors open. I'll go pray for his house, but I'll tell him about Christ. I mean, like, I'm, I don't mind. I'm not. So I go there and he's like showing me, it's a big house. It's not far away. Big house. Seven bedrooms, like pool, like bathrooms, like sky deck between the different wings. So you walk through and you can see the living room. and you, Like it's like glass. Every, I walk through there and go... <laughs> he's, he's showing me the glory of this house, all right? And we're praying in each room. He's like, oh, Pastor. And I just thought I was going to come to pray for the house. I didn't think I was going to pray for every room in the house. You know? So I'm praying and I'm praying in the bedroom and he, he's kind of praying with me and then I'm praying it praying over here in the kitchen and I'm trying to think of ways I can pray for this house so I'm thinking so I'm like in the kitchen saying Lord bless you know the home and bless those that prepare food in the, the kitchen and help it to be a place of you know warm fellowship and a place where people gather and encourage each other in Christ and so I'm like I'm genuinely praying and then he goes to one room and he says oh don't worry about that room 
That's the theatre room. But we don't need to pray in there. Now, you see why I'm using this illustration, can't you? Because every room of that, that house was open to be given over to the Lord. Now, I know the guy's not likely saved and he's got some weird ideas about what this all means in that illustration. But just for us, we can cast open the doors of every room of our life and say, Lord, I want your way when it comes to my work. I want your way when it comes to my... No, let's not use relationships because that's sometimes one we go, actually, Lord, I don't want your way. Where we go, yep, I want you at work in my my job. I want you to bless me and, and use me here. I want you to use me at church. But when it comes to, let's say, entertainment, like this guy, now those doors are shut and the Holy Spirit doesn't have opportunity to work there. You understand what it means to be filled with the Spirit? Mm -hmm. To have the influence of the Spirit permeate every area, every room, every decision, so that we walk in the Spirit and don't fulfill the lusts of the flesh. That's what it means to be filled. This is not a past event It is an ongoing, present condition. If I said to you, I was filled in the Spirit in 2015, you can tell me, Pastor, you misunderstand what that means. If you think you were filled with the Spirit at a particular point in time and it hasn't been a subsequent, if it's just been a one-off thing, that's not what it means to be filled with the Spirit. The filling of the Spirit is a condition that is based on our faith and our willingness to yield moment by moment to the Spirit's control. So yes, there are perhaps moments at camp where we surrender to Christ and we go, Lord, I know I'm saved, but I haven't been living the way I should. I surrender everything to you. And at that moment, you fling open all the doors. You say, Lord, I just want you to control. But that wasn't the moment you got filled and that condition continues every day following. No, it's a moment that needs to be refilled and refilled and refilled, if I can use that language, because it's a present ongoing command. Just because you did it once doesn't mean you don't do it every day. You don't ask the Lord. It's not even asking the Lord, Lord, please fill me. It's just, Lord, have your way. Because if we're we're craving an experience of being filled, we're missing the call just to humble obedience. What is the filling? It's to live with your life yielded to the Spirit's control. In the Scriptures, you see men described, men full of faith and full of the Holy Ghost. That was the testimony of people when they looked at the men in the book of Acts, they were looking to choose deacons, right, to call out and choose seven men to appoint over the business of ministering to the needs of the widows. And Peter says, choose out from among you seven men full of faith and full of the Holy Ghost. They were to, that was the character of their life, that that Christ, through his spirit, was working through every area of their life. So they were filled. Jesus is declared in the scripture to be one full of the Holy Spirit in Luke 4, verse 1. It's a character and a condition, not an experience that happened way back when that we're trusting in. Full of the Holy Spirit, filled with the Holy Spirit is a condition. It means also, if you're wondering, turn over to Colossians for a moment. You remember, oh, no, hold on, hold on, hold on. I want you to compare this passage in Colossians 3.16. So let's read this passage first, and then we'll go over there. So verse 18 tells us, be ye filled with the Holy Spirit. Verse 19, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Now go over to uh, Colossians, Colossians 3, which is very clearly a parallel passage where Paul addresses the same issue, but he doesn't use the phrase, be filled with the Spirit. He uses another phrase. And if one is true, then the other will be too. Have a look at verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. You see, in Ephesians, he says, be filled with the Spirit. 
which will lead to you to speak to, you, to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. When he says very similar to the, the Colossians church, he says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Now both are true. And if you are filled with the spirit, guess what? You will be filled with the word. Or the word of God will dwell in you richly. You can't be one without the other. So what? So the charismatics that are craving the experience don't read their Bible, don't know the word of Christ, it does not dwell in them richly, but they have an experience of being filled, I say garbage. Because the both will be true. If he says it in Ephesians this way and he frames it in words it this way in Colossians, there is a very sound argument that they are interchangeable. Now you go, oh, I don't know about that. Harry Ironside said it, so I'm quoting him. All right? So he's the guy who made this comment on this passage. And I quite agree with him, so I'm just repeating it to you. If one is true and the other is true and they're both consistent, then I think both are applicable. And if you argue to me that you can be filled by the, with the Spirit and walking in the Spirit but have no understanding of the Word of God, I say garbage. You need to know the Word. So the Word of God and the Spirit of God permeate every area of of your life and influence to the glory of God. The second, or sorry, the third thing I will say that the filling of, of the Spirit is, is it, is it is this, it is an ever deepening relationship with God through the person of the Holy Spirit. That's important because that's really what it's all about. It's about growing in our understanding and in our appreciation and in our fellowship with a person, not a force. It's not the Holy Spirit is like a, I don't drive an electric vehicle. It's not like the Holy Spirit is the charging station and we pull up and we get the power for the day and we drive and then we run out. So we pull up, we get the power and we drive and we pull up, we get the power. The Holy Spirit is not power, he is a person. And being filled with the Spirit is not being filled with power to do whatever we think that God wants us to do. It is to be in a close an ever-deepening relationship with the person of God through the Spirit of God. That's what it is to be filled with the Spirit. There is a lot of confusion about this, so let me explain some things that the Spirit filling of the Spirit is not. It is not the same as the baptism of the Spirit. Neither is it the same as the sealing of the Spirit. The baptism of the Spirit happens when? The moment you get saved. You are baptised by the Spirit into the body of Christ. When you're sealed by the Spirit, the same time you are sealed by the Spirit of God and baptised by the Spirit of God the moment you believe. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Let's turn to the verses that prove this. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13. That is not the one that I'm after. That's all right. 12, 13. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Some of you, I remember that verse. There is no temptation taking you, but such as common man. You're like, hey, what's he going to preach from that for? Like, wrong reference. 1 Corinthians 12, uh, verse 13. For by one Spirit are we all baptised into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have all been made to drink into one Spirit. Now I tell you this, or I ask you this. Are we ever commanded to be, as believers to be baptised in the Spirit? No. no. It's a statement of fact as to what happens when you believe. Are you ever commanded to be sealed with the Spirit? No. But are you commanded to be filled with the Spirit? Yes. So therefore they're different. Because you can't command someone to be sealed or baptised because that happens the moment you get saved. But filling is different and we are commanded because it is a subsequent and ongoing day-by-day -day experience of an ever-deepening relationship with God through His Spirit. It is not the sealing, it is not the baptism, it is not, you know, these things happen the moment of conversion, 
Romans 8 talks about it, Galatians 3 talks about it. We're sealed, even Ephesians tells us we're sealed unto the day of redemption from the moment we're saved. The filling is a habitual condition we must seek. So it's not the baptism and it's not the sealing. Neither is it a spiritual experience that elevates us to a higher plane of spiritual existence. Now that charismatics believe this, even some devotional writers and some of the people that I kind of look to kind of hint in this direction that, that when you're fully filled with the Spirit, life gets easy. That's kind of the way they say, like if you, if you open every door of your life and if you grow in maturity and as you yield everything to the Lord, temptation with sin is not so hard. So they teach this pseudo sinless perfection where if you are filled with the Spirit, you are elevated to a higher plane of experience where the Christian experience is all roses, no thorns. I think that's dangerous and wrong, right? It's, it's error. Being filled with the Spirit is not a moment that... It's not like I'm going along on this plane of existence, this struggle street and everything's hard and I keep failing and I keep falling in the same sin or I do this. But then one moment I go, Lord, have your way, take my life, you know, make me wholly thine and then zoop, I'm up to this level of experience where it's not as hard as it was yesterday because if that was true, what would you be looking for? You'd be thinking that life should be different to what it is right now if only you had enough faith. Yes? Sound like the charismatics, doesn't it? If you had enough faith, life would be better. If you only believed, you'd be on a higher plane where you know, God would pour out all of his blessings. He's pouring out his blessings on you already. You know, the trials of life are his blessing. I know you... We, anyway, I'm getting on a hobby horse. It is not the filling. The filling is not the sealing and the filling is not the baptism. And it is not a once-for-all experience that lifts you up to a higher plane and it is certainly not an irrational, ecstatic, emotional experience marked by speaking in tongues. We're going to talk about this more in the sometime down the track because it needs to be taught. Uh, there, are, there is confusion about tongues. There is confusion about the word of prophecy. There's confusion about charismatic doctrine, even here. And it needs to be taught on so you're able to understand what the Scriptures say. But when I come to this passage, and some people will read it, and it says, be filled with the Spirit, they'll go, yeah, I know what that feels like. Because I had this experience. And I, was, and I was clucking like a chicken, or barking like a dog, or rolling on the floor. And you laugh, but I'll put, a, I'll put a clip on this screen. All right? And I'll show you what people call being filled with the Spirit is. All right? And you go, that, that, no. it's happening this morning. It's happening, this, not here, right? It's like, it better not be, hang on. <laughs> but it's happening in churches right now. In the name of Christ, but by the power of the devil. That's what it is. So we read this verse, and you're saying, Pastor, why are you making a big thing of this? Because people get confused about it. Because they, they, they visit places, they hear things, and someone will say something, they think, oh, maybe that's what it does mean. It, it doesn't. Being filled is to be completely under the influence of the Spirit, which leads us to the bearing of the fruit of the Spirit. That's what it is. Not the ecstatic experience. We'll talk about it in more detail when I've got the, the time and liberty, but I just want to encourage us today because we're not, to, most of us here today aren't going, well, I, I know what it is to be filled with the Spirit, I know what it's not, but I'm not really sure whether I'm obeying this command or not. That's a good thing to think about. And Paul gives us, as he continues in Ephesians 5, he gives us four blessed results of being filled with the Spirit. Because he doesn't just leave it there and says, don't be drunk with wine, where is in excess. Be filled with the Spirit. And then he goes on to say, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. That's the result of being filled with the Spirit. He goes on to talk about submitting to one another in the fear of Christ, the fear of God. That's a result of being filled with the Spirit. There are four of them here. I just want to point, it out, point them out to you as we work our way through drawing things to a, a practical conclusion. 
Go back to Ephesians with me, Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5 and verse 19 now, and we see these four blessed results of being filled with the Spirit. He says, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Now, the first thing that I see here is that someone filled with the Spirit has a desire, an appetite for public, corporate worship. Say, so how does it say that? Because it says speaking to yourselves. It's like you talk to yourself in Psalms. No, speak to one another. Yourselves. Speak to one another in Psalms and hymns. When do you do that? When you sing together. When you worship and praise together. You speak to yourselves and encourage. I want to ask you this question. Who do you think first started singing? Was it Paul or Silas in the Philippian jail cell? In the jail cell at Philippi? We don't know, do we? We don't know who first started singing, but I tell you what, the one who said, hey, why don't we sing, was not thinking about witnessing to the prisoners alone. That would maybe part of his motive. But I know that he was trying to encourage his brother with the circumstances in which they found themselves and they're there going, we've been beaten and imprisoned for just honouring the Lord and if there was ever a place for singing and singing together to lift up and edify one another, Paul and Silas are in the pit, aren't they? They're right there. We all go, oh, wow, the prisoners heard them and they, they, you know, they got saved and the earthquake happened, the bars flew open and no one ran away. The Philippian jailer's there, he's going to run himself through. He's, oh, no, do thyself no harm. It's a great story. But who's the first guy who started singing? He was filled with the Spirit because he was encouraging his brother in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. And I wonder if it was Paul because Paul's telling believers here to do exactly that. So this is what happens when you throw the doors open to the Spirit in every area. You will have an appetite or a desire for corporate worship. I don't know whether you like singing. You might feel embarrassed. I, I do sometimes. I go, oh, I wish I could sing better than I do. But so often we let our own insecurities stop us from edifying a brother or a sister in song. You know, you'd have to have a really, 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 really bad voice for anyone here to go, oh, because that's what you're worried about, isn't it? Like that's some, I, I kind of go, oh, people are going to hear me and they're going to be like, oh, what is he even doing that for? You'd have to, like, can you imagine like having that attitude? If you hear someone praising the Lord and it's out of key and it's just tone deaf and you're like, I just wish he'd stop. Can you imagine a Christian thinking that of another Christian? Would you think that of me or would I? No. Yeah. yeah they... <laughs> I open the door. <laughs> All right. I know, I open the door. <laughs> so, you know, in a practical, just a couple of practical words, our singing here as a church is a blessing to me. Right? It is a blessing to me to sing with you and to praise God and I find it an encouragement when we gather and we sing. Some churches have the liberty, the blessing of a beautiful vaulted ceiling. You know, the big, you go into the big cathedrals and you speak and the, the sound resonates and it's, the sound is just well structured. Some churches have the benefit, the blessing of a high, lofted, kind of angled ceiling. We don't. You see? You know why the cathedrals have pews that are hard? Oh, it's just to make you uncomfortable. You know what soft, comfortable seats do? They absorb the sound. So when we sing as a congregation in this room, we have a couple of things, just practical and I'm not suggesting we change those things, but I'm just bringing them to your attention that the sound in here is muted just by the logistics of this building. Right? That's just a practical statement. So sometimes you feel like our singing is not like resounding and encouraging and people aren't really getting involved because it sounds a little bit muted. It's not actually a reflection of the condition of the hearts of the people you're singing with as much as it is there are some reasons why it feels and sounds that way. Do you think God knows that? Yeah. Do you think maybe we can just sing a little bit louder? 
You say, do we have to, Pastor? <laughs> well, if I can, if you feel that that muted kind of, yeah, people are singing, but they're not really, they don't really mean what they're saying, they're not excited about what they're saying. If that's the impression people get when they sing with us, is that a good testimony? No. Is it better to sing with joy in your heart and to sing loudly and proclaim Christ and to, to glory and sound a little bit off key and miss a note here and there? And like, that's much better than to give the impression that you don't care about Christ and worship isn't important. All right? Closing hymn's going to be interesting, isn't it? <laughs> we'll have to do a vocal warm up. No, I'm. The last thing that I want to encourage you is to think about worship for show. Because that's the alternative. You can just be worried about what everyone else is thinking about you, but really, it should be a heartfelt expression to the Lord. And Paul here also adds this element of encouraging and edifying your brethren with song. All right? So he talks about Psalms. You know, that's the book of Psalms. That's the song book of the Jews. It's the, the Old Testament song book. And there was a psalm for every occasion in Jewish festival and life. Like there was a psalm for everything. There was a series of psalms they would sing as they were ascending the steps to go up to the temple. And they'd sing them on each... Like there's... There's a whole like musical life to Israel that we Gentiles go, huh? We don't understand it. But the Psalms is the Old Testament songbook. It goes on to talk about hymns. You know, we sing hymns. I'm not sure exactly what Paul was defining to be a hymn when he wrote that word here, but we, they're songs which glorify and exalt Christ. All right? They're simple songs that are to be sung together. That's the other, the other truth. And then spiritual songs opens the door and you can go, well, that means any music with... No, I'm not saying that. But here he includes psalms, hymns and spiritual songs as means to edify and encourage one another and to worship. If you're filled with the Spirit, you'll have an appetite to do that. If you're not filled with the Spirit, you could take it or leave it. So if you're sitting there this morning going, am I filled with the Spirit? Do you want to sing the closing hymn or don't you? Soon. <laughs> That's what I'm asking. And if, if, you're, if you know within your own heart, you're like, no, I can't, no, then that's an indication that you need to throw open that area of your life, your voice, your song, the joy of your heart to the Lord and allow the Spirit to have that influence. You have a desire not just for public worship, but for private, because he says here, the first is the public worship, the second is private, because he's speaking to yourselves, one another, in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Do you, have a, do you have a song in your heart this morning? Is it the song of redemption? Is it the song of salvation? Is it, a, is it a delight in who Christ is and what he's done for you? You know, that idea of melody is like to pluck or strum, and it's the picture of plucking the, the strings on a harp. And I was thinking about this, it's a lot like the spirit is plucking the strings of the heart, creating a melody within us causes us to sing internally. Have you ever been guilty of walking around with a song in your heart? That just, you, sometimes it's hymns for me because it's what we sing at church. I get them stuck in my head and I, I tell you what, I, I used to extract honey for a living um, on my own. I, I was working in a factory set up. I was alone for 12 hours, which is torture. All right? it, for someone like me, it is. It's really, really hard. So I would sing all day long and sometimes people would hear me because I didn't know they'd pull up outside the shed and they'd hear me wailing inside but I would sing the joy of my heart would come out and it would be like I'd go through the hymn book the reason I, I kind of think about song numbers is because I remember the number then the hymn then the lyrics and I try and sing it all the way through the hymn book when I was working there extracting honey do you have a, a song in your heart is it does it ever cheer you along life's way. If you're filled with the Spirit, that plucking of the heartstrings, that will happen and be your experience. Fruit of the Spirit is joy. Seen in our song. All right. Thirdly, you have a desire to give thanks. Look at verse 20. 
giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know he says giving thanks always for all things, all twice. It's hard enough to give thanks for some things. How do you go giving thanks for all things always? Wow. <laughs> A Christian filled with the Spirit will give thanks for all things always. Even though it's hard. I find it very easy to be a glass, oh, yeah, that's true. Very easy to be a glass half empty kind of person. I can slip into that. Is that your predisposition? If someone said such and such, is a glass half full kind of person or a glass half empty kind of person? If you're in the empty category, then you have to work especially hard at this. Doesn't mean like it's who you are, it's what you wrestle with, but you must work hard to do what? Not be unthankful or do you have to work hard to remind yourself of the things for which we should be thankful? Count your blessings is the answer to unthankfulness. So you count your blessings, you go, well, by the way, don't start with an earthly perspective when you're counting your blessings. If your list goes food, shelter, family, those things aren't that important in comparison to salvation, security, a relationship with God, peace in my heart, deliverance from the power of sin. I mean, they're the blessings that ought to capture our mind and our thoughts when we're struggling to be thankful for the job layoff or the bad report from the doctors and things like that. Right? Because it's really hard to be thankful for those, those things if we haven't got a heavenly perspective. A spirit-filled person will give thanks always for all things. The Bible tells us that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are the called according to his purpose. It doesn't say that all things are good. It says all things work together for good. So, and we are filled with a spirit more prone and apt to follow the exhortation from James where we are to what? Count it all joy when we fall into diverse temptations, knowing that it's the trying of our faith that works patience and that patience has a perfect work that we may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. The last evidence or results of being filled with the Spirit and you've been very patient is in verse 21, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. And we're going to talk about submission one to another and the way that looks in different areas of life, husbands to wives, wives to husbands, slaves to masters, masters to slaves. So Paul is going to take this point in verse 21 and he's going to use it as a springboard to address you know, our walk down the altar for the marriage vows. He's going to talk about our, our walk to work or at work. He's going to use that little springboard about submission one to another and introduce it to a number of areas. So we'll come back and look at it. But for today... It's good for us to know that as a Christian filled with the Spirit, we will naturally have a desire to submit one to another in the fear of God. And submitting here is a military term which means to fall in rank under another. And we don't like that. We find it difficult because it rubs against the heart and rubs against the flesh. But in that passage in Philippians 2, where we read of that humiliation of Christ, where he left heaven and became a man, he says this, let this mind also be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. All right. He says, who been in the form of God? But he says, let the mind of humility that Christ demonstrated in leaving heaven to become a man be in you. That we might have the willingness to lay aside whatever it is in order to in the fear of God, in order to bless and to serve and to care for others. We live in a day where this is a, an unheard of concept. No one wants to give an inch. But Christians led by the Spirit, filled by the Spirit, will do just that. Um, Jesus is the supreme example of that. So, if you were arrested this morning and the charge is you are filled with the Spirit, would there be enough evidence to, to convict that's a good question, isn't it? If someone said, oh, that person is filled with the Spirit, prove it. How do you know? And for those of us that are 
struggling with the thought of having to sing publicly in a little bit or struggling with the idea of giving thanks for everything, let that be a warning and a, just a, a rebuke in love that that is a good test to know whether God has influence over every area of your life. If the Holy Spirit pulled out, it's another way of looking at it. If the Holy Spirit, then the Holy Spirit won't, all right? Sealed by the Spirit, indwelt by the Spirit is a permanent, unchanging relationship between God and believers. But just in a, an imaginary sense, if the Spirit pulled out and stopped moving you or bearing fruit in you, would it make your life look any different? I mean, if you're a cranky, fleshly person, day in, day out, and the Holy Spirit goes, no difference. You'll still be a cranky, fleshly person. But if you are filled with the Spirit and the Spirit's presence and influence was kind of quenched or removed, I know he can't go, but if that was the case, then it would make a drastic change. So there's another way of kind of thinking about it. God has called us to a life of daily dependence on his Spirit. And if you haven't been walking in the Spirit, then today and now is the time to do that by allowing Him to have influence in every area. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank You for the time we've had in the Word. We thank You for the, the patience of the folks um, and the attention to the Scriptures. We pray that You might work in our hearts and lives in every area. Uh, help us to yield entirely to You. Uh, help our vessel to be empty that You may fill it and use us as You see fit. And Lord, we thank you for the joy and the peace and the blessings that are ours in Christ. Uh, Lord, the life of consecration and sacrifice and yielding to you is not the life of misery, but one of perfect, of, of complete and mature blessing. And we pray that you would help us to see that. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, Dave, can you close with our final hymn this morning, please?